classical Najdor was named after a Ar Argentinian grandmaster named Miguel Najdor, who played against Bobby Fischer several times and famously lost a game in his namesake opening, the Najdor. Bobby Fischer used uh, what then was considered a novelty. It was the Adams attack, which we're going to learn in this course, to defeat Najdor himself in his own opening, which is pretty cool. And it shows us the power of certain lines. And it also shows us the power of Bobby Fischer because he used a move that became a super strong grandmaster move like in 2008 after computers showed how good it was against the Najdorf is a really subtle pawn move and Fisher used it way back in 1950s and 60s and show, so it shows you that he, could, he would either discover these novelties on his own or he would see someone else play something and he would recognize his power after some deep thinking about it and um, so we'll learn about that in the Adams Attack lesson. In this lesson, we're going to just go over the very basic positions of the Najdorf and kind of explain why it's such a popular response to e4 for black. Basically, the reason it's so popular, especially compared to the dragon variation and others at the highest level, is that it's super flexible. When you play the sixth move, a1, or excuse me, a6 with your pawn, it leaves you open. You can transpose into the Shevardingen, which we're also going to learn about. You can even even still transpose back into a dragon with a different move order. You can see what white is going to do. Are they going to try to use the the English attack, the Yugoslav attack, or the Perez, the Karez attack, or how are they going to set up their position? And so it allows you a lot of flexibility, and it also just simply avoids some of white's best attacking formations. For example, a lot of people play the dragon, they get checkmated by that Yugoslav attack that I showed you guys, and it can be really hard to combat if you don't play really good defense. A lot of people don't like putting themselves in that situation. If you play a strong chess player and they play the Yugoslav attack against your dragon, you can lose some games that way if you're not really careful. I'm not worried about it because I've studied it a lot and I like the counterattacking chances. You nullify their attack and then you can get a checkmate on your own. So it's really fun to play. But for a lot of people, they don't like having to be put under that pressure because it's almost impossible to avoid a good Yugoslav attack if you play the dragon, at least in terms of them like reaching your king faster than you will reach their queen side. So it's almost impossible to avoid having to play maybe a little bit of defense or making some prophylactic moves, as we say. So let me show you guys why the Nadjorv is so flexible. And you'll see lots of different positions with it, which is why you can see this game being played over and over and over again. And every time there's a tiny variation, a slight move order change or whatever, it leads to some cases drastically different positions. So we see the same moves. We already know what the Najdorf is. So we play a6. Now, even already, white can respond in lots of different ways. They can go to the English attack, which is basically the same as the Yugoslav attack, only it's a different name because in the position of the Najdorf or the Sheminingen, um, things are different. You're not King Kedo, your bishop on g7. And so white still sets his position up like the Yugoslav attack, um, as we'll see here in a moment. And it works against all the Sicilians. So if you play the Sicilian as white, setting up that Yugoslav attack slash English attack setup, that pattern, it works against all of them. So it's a good thing to know because you don't have to change how you play against other openings. However, as you get better, you're definitely going to want to learn different attacks and different ways to approach the position, especially if like you're going to play one person multiple times. You want to be able to give them different variations and change it up on them and stuff like that. So let's say white chooses to play bishop e3. It's one of the solid moves here. And then this is the key move in the Najdorf if you go into the classic main lines. You play d5. If you just play d6 here, that's going into a Shivaningen, which is a very solid defensive position, which has become less popular now, as I'll show you in a later lecture, due to something called the um, Keres attack. Or there's another one called the Hungarian attack which have been very um, useful, very powerfully used against the Sheveningen. And so if your opponent knows those lines, it can put you under a lot of pressure. So the Najdorf avoids the dragon. It avoids the uh, certain lines in the Sheveningen. And it's really aggressive and it also allows you to be flexible. So usually the knight will go back over here to b3, and then we will play bishop 2, e7, and get ready to castle. Now, this looks kind of weird because normally we wouldn't want to have like a backwards pawn here on d6, it looks like a weakness. 
But in this particular position, computers and grandmasters have analyzed it's solid because it can be defended by both your queen and bishop. And later on, we could push it into the center if we choose to. We can also even play f5, depending on the position, um, later on if we choose to. And while it looks like this square is a nice outpost for white's knights, you really, you really can't do anything from there. We're not really worried about that. So it's not something that you need to worry about. Certain positions like this, things look like a weakness. It's like I showed you in the dragon when you put your bishop on e6 and you block in the pawn. It's usually bad to block in your pawns with bishops like that. It, it hurts your development. But since you have fianchettoed and since you have no plan to move that pawn, that's part of the dragon formation. It's a really natural place to put the bishop as long as it can't be easily chased away by a knight, which is why sometimes we trade off that knight. So this is a position you gain a tempo by knocking that knight back, and then usually you'll either play bishop to e6, or you can just castle right away here. So I'm going to show you guys a couple different variations and a couple different move orders, just so you can see the really good position that you get as black. And remember, the goal of the opening for black is to equalize. It means to take away white's initiative that they get from moving first. And so the Nasdorf does this very well, and it gets an equal position very easily. So you're not going to be getting a whole bunch of fireworks. A lot of times the Nasdorf positions will be relatively strategic and positional, depending on what your opponent does, depending on what white does. But you're going to get a good position pretty much no matter what, and it's going to be a nice strategic game. It's kind of like a Spanish opening in the sense that it's going to be very strategic in every single case. You're not going to have a lot of immediate you know, checks, checkmates, or, or attacks. And that's one of the powerful things about playing this A6 move. It stops not one, not two, but three pieces from being able to use this b5 square. Because remember, the knight was over here. And so neither one of these knights can go down. The bishop can't go down. It stops all those things. And it also prepares later on for us to play b5. In the Najdor, if you're almost always going to play b5 at some point and expand, it gives you this option of knocking this knight off this square again, which can be useful depending on what he does. And you get a lot of space on the queen side. And that's a key theme in all of these Sicilian defense openings for black. Okay, so if he decides to go into the typical English attack, right? Yugoslav attack in the dragon, English attack in the Nazdor. And he puts his queen on d2. We're going to follow this line. So we castle. He, he gets his bishop out, gets ready to castle long. Normally, once the knight's already on b3, the bishop doesn't want to go all the way up to c4 now because it can't retreat there. That square is being taken up. So it's not very natural. It's a natural place to put the bishop onto e2 here. So we'll take our bishop out. We can also, if we want to, and this is another reason why the Nazdor bishop is so flexible, we can play b5 here right now and then fianchetto our bishop and put pressure on this pawn. It's a matter of choice, a matter of taste. Both are popular. Um, so I'm going to show you this typical move here, putting both of these bishops on top of each other on e7 and e6. And this bishop is a good piece. It's aimed out at, at the board. This bishop right now is defending mostly this pawn. And so our white bishop in this case is our stronger of the bishops that have more mobility, right? It almost always is going to be a good bishop and a bad bishop, as we say. One of them will be stronger than the other ones. Usually the stronger bishop is the one that is on the opposite color from most of your pawns because your pawn will block in the other bishop and limit its mobility. It's like in the French defense, the light squared bishop is usually a really weak piece because it'll be blocked in by the pawns, and we're willing to accept the weakness of having a bad bishop in order to get the other benefits from the opening um, in terms of the, what you get from the French defense, the open C file and a really good pawn structure, you know, other compensation like that. And so in this case, it's good to know that this white bishop is a good piece. So if, if white decides to put the knight down here, which may be something that you're looking at, we don't really want to take it. If we take that, it lodges his pawn up in our face, and it's good for white. It gives him a lot of space. So while normally we don't want to let a knight just get a nice outpost like this, in this case, um, we wouldn't take it. We would just leave it there. And obviously, this, in this case, this particular move order, he's left his pawn hanging here on e4, so we can just take his pawn. So we can't actually do that yet anyway. This bishop is offended, so nothing is being threatened. We would, he would just lose a pawn, so we can't do that yet anyway. But even if later on he decides to do that once, for example, he if he plays uh, f3 and defends his pawn, we're still not worried at all about him putting his knight here. The best thing to do is not to take it. If you watch any Grandmaster games, they will almost always leave it there, at least for a while, 
until something changes in the position, right? Because chess is dynamic, things aren't always going to be the same. Okay, so now he's castled long. We go ahead and play b5. This is a natural continuation. He decides to play f3 with his plan of doing the English attack and playing g4 and h5, h4 and doing the normal pawn storm attack on us. It's often good to put the knight on d7 in this position because it clears the c file for a rook. And then he'll immediately start the pawn storm attack. We might put the, the queen here on uh, c6. In this case, if he decides to play knight to f5, well, we probably will take it because we don't want to have to move the queen back and lose a tempo and then maybe trade. So these are just some examples. This is a typical classic sort of a Nash door. You see that you're going to have a strategic game. Black's going to be trying to put pressure on the queen side, probably knock this, this uh, knight off this post and notice that the queen's across from the king. And so while white has a good attacking chance with this pawn storm and the English attack, Black has some pressure too because we've castled on opposite sides of the king. It's similar to the dragon in that case, only Black's defense, the setup is much more solid than in the dragon. So very strategic, lots of really fun games that you'll get out of this. You'll move this rook over and you guys will both attack each other's kings. So that's just the very basic Najdorf situation. And there's lots of different moves that have been played. So now I want to show you guys if instead of going queen two and going into the English attack, a lot of opponents at all levels will castle on the same side in the Najdorf instead of going for that English attack. And oops, we don't want to, want to go back here. Bishop e2. Why are you not doing that bishop e2 move? So let's say he goes bishop e2 and he's going to castle this way instead. So now we can get our bishop out. We both castle on the same side. And then they will typically play this move at some point. They'll play f4. And now the goal for white is going to be to move the queen over to the king side and attack our queen. So it's going to be different. We might play b5. If they do go ahead and push this pawn down, uh, it's not really an issue for us. We just back it up. And now we can do a couple things. They might move their queen over and get ready to attack. We can knock this this knight out here, and then we would win a pawn because this pawn wouldn't be defended. So this b5 move here, if their knight is on c3, which it almost always will be, we always have this option of knocking it off. And he's defending this pawn right here. So usually a premature push with a pawn right here, it will, it will fail to a little tactic or to losing a pawn. So it's not good for them to do that. So we don't have to worry about that. And what he'll usually do is move the queen over first, or even move the bishop over like this, and defend that pawn for that very reason. And then later on, if he wants to, maybe he can push his pawn, knock our bishop back, maybe move the knight down, because now the, the pawn's defended. And so this is just a, basically a slow sort of movement of pieces for white over to the king side. Strong grandmaster players don't usually play this pawn move down, down here. They will um, either take this pawn or they will just leave this setup as it is and get all the pieces over and wait for the right moment to uh, attack. Okay, so let's go. Let's back it up. So instead of instead of taking that right there, they might go something like move the queen over instead. Okay, and then we will simply continue to develop. So let's say we go here and. He might want to move his queen over to here. And now it's across from our king. Okay, we can't put the knight on h5, which we typically could do if both defending this and attacking the queen, because the bishop has it. And so white has a good attacking chance here. We also we don't want to take this pawn usually right here, because when he takes back now, this kind of is a weakness. It's an isolated pawn, and we're allowing his pieces to get out towards our king. So we usually just leave the pawn structure as it is, and we focus on either defending or expanding on the queen side. So for example, we can knock this guy off. And if he wants to lodge the knight up in here now, it's fine because when you're being attacked, trades almost always benefit you. And now if we take this knight and he takes back, now he's, he's messed up his pawn structure. We could do something like this. And this isn't a great, a great position, but we've closed the position down. It's just an example. So trades 
usually benefit the defender. The attacking team will usually want to keep as many pieces on the board for the attack. So it's a good thing to keep in mind whether you're attacking or you're defending. Okay, so that's just a basic setup, basic example of what you'll see in the Najdor. Queenside attack, on a queenside expansion for black, a kingside attack for white. If they castle on the same side as you, they'll usually rotate their pieces around. I'm moving their bishop here. I'm moving the queen over. It's a very typical thing to do. And depending on the situation, at some point we can expand here, we can expand here, we can do many things. We can make him, we can expand our knight here, and there might be a lot of trades. There's lots of calculation that might need to happen if they decide they want to trade off pieces like this. I mean, this benefits black. Okay, so you notice there's a lot of chances on both sides. There's a lot of strategic stuff going on, and there's a lot of calculation that needs to happen. So it's a good game. It's really fun to play. And uh, there's lots and lots of stuff. You know, I encourage you to look up and study it more. There's only so much I can show you in a, in a short lesson on the Najdor. But in the next few lectures, we're going to look at specific lines and how to counter those different attacks from white.